Cool. All right. Take your seats. I know you're excited. The time for the state of AGL plumbing and services has arrived. Um, good. Uh, just to start off, I'll introduce ourselves. I'm Scott Murray. I've uh, been using Linux since 1996. And started off as hobbyist and then was lucky to turn it into a career. And I've been doing embedded Linux since uh, 2000. A uh, couple brief breaks to do our toss stuff. Uh, and today I'm a principal software engineer at Consolco. And uh, over to Matt. I'm Matt Porter. Uh, I've been a Linux user developer since way back in 92, believe it or not, so as a university student. And uh, doing embedded Linux became my full time job back in 99. And I'm currently uh, working as the CTO of Consolco Group. Um, <clears throat> little syllabus for our class today. Um, we're going to go through just an overview of AGL, uh, a little bit about the release history. Um, keep in mind, through the magic of the Linux Foundation scheduling, this is essentially a follow-on to Walt Miner's talk about AGL this morning, and we're going to go more in depth into uh, uh, the APIs and, and uh, some, some guts of that. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about current and planned uh, features. Uh, at that level, uh, build system, give you a little overview of what that looks like, uh, how things are organized, some of the plumbing components, right? We borrow that term from Linux Plumbers Conference, right? That uh, ecosystem middleware, if you will, that we have in the Linux community. Um, then we'll look at the application framework in a little depth, and then kind of get in the meat, which is the APIs or bindings. Um, and then we'll look a little bit at roadmap and talk about maybe how you can get involved. All right, so overview. Um, so automotive grade Linux, if you hadn't heard from Wallminer's talk, it's an embedded Linux distribution targeting IVI and now ADAS products. All right, historically it was IVI and the, the scope is expanding, all right, to, to cover what's, what's needed uh, in real products. Um, it's based on open embedded build system and Yocto project Pogi reference distro. Um, and uh, so one of the key things is there's, a, there's an application framework, well-defined application framework uh, for developing uh, applications um, to make that a lot simpler than the uh, very random libraries we might work with on traditional Linux on a daily basis. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, an SDK that has to go along with that. So the goal is to provide a, a secure um, uh, application runtime environment well, something sandboxed and, and a uniform set of APIs meeting uh, developer needs. Uh, and so the, the purpose of this is to provide a base, a common base for real products in the automotive market. All right, a little bit of history of where AGLs come from and, and the features associated with some of the releases. So this started um, the first release, and you see there these lovely cute names, right? Um, with, with fish. <laughs> uh, so we have Agile Abacore all the way back in 2016. And we had some basic things like a most driver uh, for audio and a few demo apps. Right? And then Brilliant Blowfish, you see this trend every six months. Um, July 2016, that's when the first version of the application framework came in, and then also uh, some audio routing functionality uh, that came on behalf of, of Geneva's, Geneva's audio manager um, framework. And then Charming Chinook, uh, that brought in some of the first uh, application framework bindings. So these are actual APIs are exposed to application developers in a well-defined way. So for Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, radio, you can see those are sort of commodity things that you need in a vehicle. <clears throat> also, uh, the Cross SDK um, first uh, became available there and uh, a lot of additional BSP support. So that was about the time that interest is picking up and a lot more people wanted their boards supported. You head forward to Daring Dab, uh, July this year. Um, that brought uh, an enhanced version of the application framework. It's what we're working against these days as developers. Um, and then some additional uh, bindings, things that you would strike you as being necessary in a vehicle as well. Also, Smart Device Link, uh, which is another app framework uh, for an open sourced um, uh, their framework for applications. 
And the next one is going to be electric eel, and that's what we're working on in, in mainline and master of AGL for any of our new development now, and that's targeted for January 2018. Um, so right now, we've got an application framework, we have some core APIs, we have audio, uh, audio routing, um, and then we have some demo applications. Um, what's in tree today is some cute QML-based uh, applications, but um, as you may have heard in Walt's uh, discussion or talk, that uh, um, the intention here is to be UI independent. That's, that's really a hard requirement in this market. Um, so everything needs to be UI independent. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get into why and how we're doing these APIs. Um, so in the future, um, we're going to have an audio API, media player API, window manager, home screen, um, storage API, all these things. You'll see trends with these that kind of map, map out to um, the types of APIs that you see in popular mobile operating system ecosystems. Okay, and we'll talk about that when we get into the meat of it. So I'll let Scott talk about build system. Yeah, so the, um, the build system and uh, <coughs> distribution organization aren't dramatically surprising to anyone who's familiar with open embedded and, and the Octo project uh, reference distribution. So uh, AGL is actually based on the Octo project Pocky distribution and uh, uses a, you know, basically a set of layers on top of that. So we've got a weak core, which is the actual open embedded core. That's the basis of Pocky. Uh, a bunch of the open, uh, meta open embedded layers are used to provide various utilities and daemons. So that includes things like meta networking, meta Perl, meta Python, things like that. That are a lot of those are prerequisites for other things. Uh, so the security aspect of AGL is provided by uh, a couple of layers that are currently carried in the meta Intel IoT security uh, uh, repository. So we get our layers that give us Smack support and Sonera from there. Um, and so those are the backbone of the security uh, mechanism used by AGL. Uh, then the actual meta AGL layers are sort of uh, contained in a repository uh, together. So there's a, one for the app framework, which we've been talking about, and uh, I will discuss further as we go along. There's a a BSP fix-up layer where we have some tweaks to the various vendor DSPs or open source DSPs uh, to uh, kind of uh, you know smooth the rough patches over as we go along in our upgrade cycle. Uh, there's actual the distro layer for Meta AGL has the distro configuration, and there's a IVI common which contains a set of package groups uh, that group sets of functionality together that you can select to provide different. Uh, vehicle infotainment features in your final configuration. Uh, so uh, Matt had mentioned that the demos are actually based on Qt uh, and QML. So there's Meta Qt5. Uh, then of course the Meta AGL demo layer actually contains the demo applications that you can use when you actually build a demo image of AGL. And of course the all important BSP layers themselves get your board support. Uh, so there's you know dozen boards or more actually supported out of the box and use layers such as Meta Freescale, uh, Meta Renaissance Arcar Gen 3 for the uh, current sort of uh, focus of uh, AGL for board support is the Renaissance's uh, M3 ultra low, excuse me, ultra low cost board or H3 board, and then Meta TI for things like TI value. And of course, there's also a Raspberry Pi and a handful of IMX6 boards. So there's definitely a lot of flexibility there. And so with this nice layer stack, you can kind of control feature set and you know, sw easily switch in another board. So hand over to Matt to talk about some of the plumbing and the services that are based on top of it. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so Scott uh, covered the layout of how these layers are um, separated and um, just to talk, kind of highlight uh, some of the key components, uh, plumbing pieces uh, in the distribution. Uh, it's system D based. Um, when you run an application, each application is a service. Um, so we're making use of uh, system D's uh, uh, ability to help us sandbox things. Um, and then uh, one of the things coming in the future, and again, Walt already trumped us by mentioning it, is that uh, AGL is considering moving to dynamic users and using that feature, that new feature in the future. Um, 
Uh, on the audio side, we're uh, using also in Pulse Audio. No big surprises there. Um, that'll continue to be a theme throughout this talk, is there's no surprises here, right? You're going to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, the one you may not be familiar with is the Geneva Audio Manager. Um, that's a pro project from the Geneva organization. Um, we've been uh, using that for policy-driven audio routing. Um, it has the notion, it uh, works in con conjunction with uh, Pulse Audio. Um, there is a uh, Pulse Audio plugin, and then um, if you've ever worked with the corking plugins, they have very fixed uh, policies, right? They're based on parameters, and this allows one to, to write a, uh, a very complex uh, XML-based policy. There's a big rules engine that operates with that router uh, module uh, that plugs into Pulse Audio and allows you to do uh, uh, dynamic uh, policies um, for corking and so forth. Um, <clears throat> on the graphics side, um, it's purely a Wayland Weston uh, architecture. Um, the key differentiator from those of you who are running it on your desktop, say on Fedora now, is that it's using IVI shell. Um, one, of the, one of the unique things, if you're not aware of what IVI shell is, in vehicle infotainment, of course, um, is that uh, that works in conjunction with the uh, layer manager. Um, and so one of the unique requirements in the automotive um, industry is to be able to uh, separate uh, aspects of the application in layers. Um, so a great example that people always use is a nav app. The actual, uh, the backend engine and the graphics rendering may be a completely different engine from, from the, the UI decorations, right? So they might have one layer which would map to a surface in Wayland, right? Expose that with the graphics of that map being rendered in the turn by turn, but have different decorations and controls on another layer. Right, so they might have a proprietary piece that does that, and the rest is the, the UI. So that's what IVI shell is. Um, Bluetooth, Blue Z5, location services. We're using GPSD, GeoClue. Um, we'll talk more about those later and how they're used in depth. Um, telephony, Ophono, um, networking, Conman, WPA supplicant. Looks a lot like a desktop distro, right? Yeah, so all these familiar friends. All right, I'm going to let ta uh, Scott, sorry, Scott, uh, <laughs> introduce the application framework. So uh, Matt just described the actual plumbing. The application framework is what basically uh, AGL uses to sort of uh, contain that and expose it in a sort of controlled way with you know, you know, declared interfaces that people can write against and not have to worry about hitting the low-level interfaces of these different applications or daemons. So what is the application framework? It provides a sandboxed application runtime environment, which I think Matt's already said, but uh, implements a complete application lifecycle co covering install uh, and basically startup and potentially upgrade. Um, and using systemd C groups, uh, SMAC and Sonera provides a uh, secure runtime environment. And there's also a Sonera-enabled Dbus daemon that's used to control some of the aspects of the Sonera security policies. Uh, this is all sort of controlled through a WebSocket interface to the bindings that the APIs define. And so that's how applications actually talk to each other and to the uh, underlying uh, implementations of the application APIs. And there's a uh, W3C widget specification that's actually being used by AGL for the packaging of the applications. And that's how actually in the configuration of that, they sort of expose what their uh, required uh, binding APIs are and what they provide. So that's how things are actually able to be connected together and you know, work as a system. So there's a couple links in that slide uh, to a lot more information about the widgets and also a high level description of the actual application framework. There's quite a bit of documentation on the docs automotivelinux.org site. And if you have any more interest in this, there's quite a bit of material there for you to dig down and do some deep diving. Uh, so binding overview. So the actual bindings are to abstract the UI from the backend implementation. So as Matt sort of already sort of alluded to, this allows you to basically replace your UI with your own sort of custom one or switch to a different UI toolkit. These existing demo apps use uh, QML, you know, cute-based apps. 
but you could do an HTML5 UI, you could do a completely you know, native toolkit of your own choice, and the mechanism allows you to do that. And uh, as I said, this allows you to reuse all, actually, your back-end application. Um, as well, the mechanism allows you to have fine-grained security control over what applications you're actually able to talk to and you know, provide some levels of access control so that you don't have applications potentially talking to parts of the API that you don't expect them to. Uh, and so this is done with SMAC and the scenario mechanisms. Um, and the end goal is to provide a complete and consistent API. We want pe people to be able to develop apps for AGL and know that they'll work going forward, or at least we'll have a you know, versioning of the binding APIs that they'll be able to easily upgrade and have their apps work on different AGL-compatible platforms that people build with the AGL distribution. And there's, once again, if you're looking for more information, there is quite a bit of documentation on how the bindings work. So just a quick blurb on how bindings are actually put together. The actual implementation of a binding is done in a shared library. Uh, there's a, a basic an API for the bindings themselves. And so you provide this information when you actually register a binding. Your implementation provides a name, a list of, of binding verbs, or which are the actions that the binding supports being uh, uh, done through it. Um, contains actually the implementation of the verbs and the events, the actual back-end logic to implement the verbs. And as well, there's a pre-init and init to give you a couple levels of initialization. Uh, init is actually what happens when the application does connect. Pre-init is basically when you're starting up and the binding gets loaded. So it gives you a couple levels of initialization. There's a specification now in the newer version 2 of the binding framework that allows you to describe the API with OpenAPI, which potentially allows us some degree of introspection. Your application could actually take that string and actually parse the XML and work out what the binding exposes. There's actually a textual description. Uh, and there's, as well, there's some event handling stuff related to tracing and profiling of the uh, binding API. There's this extra callback in there for that. And as well, there's actually now in version 2 a no concurrency flag. Uh, the binding APIs are pretty much fully asynchronous, except in this case, if you set no concurrency, verb calls into the API will actually be concurrent for that application. So that simplifies application development for some situations where if you're writing a very simple app, you might not want to have to worry about a lot of asynchronous programming. But in general, this isn't recommended. You should be prepared to have your app actually receive a whole bunch of asynchronous events because that's the world we live in today. Pretty much anything particularly complicated at all has to handle asynchronous behavior. And so by default, that's kind of the behavior that the binding APIs expose. So just to continue, when you actually start up an app, the uh, application and, and, and binding packaging with the widget format includes this XML file, uh, which specifies you know, description of the application the name and the author and the license and such stuff, list the permissions that that package requires and the bindings that it requires and the bindings that it provides. Uh, so when an app application is started by the application framework, it spawns an AFB daemon uh, instance, which loads and initializes the bindings that that application says it requires uh, and provides, uh, executes the application and pass port numbers and authentication token arguments to the spawned application for it to communicate with the binding daemon. And it's, remembered, it's important to remember that in this case, with the architecture of the, uh, the binding framework, every instance of the binding is separate. So if an application loads a binding and another application loads the same binding, there are separate instances basically separate loads of the shared library. So if you have um, a basically shared resource that the binding is providing access to, you do have to worry about concurrency control. You'll have to implement a mechanism for that in the binding, potentially with things like DBus or other IPC to actually control that. Uh, so this is a very quick run through of application bindings. There's a lot more detail about this and how you actually implement a binding to expose functionality for application use. And it, once again, there's quite a bit of documentation on the docs site. And so just a quick sort of run through of how the bindings are used in an app. Um, 
So the, uh, the interface is basically through uh, HTTP requests or WebSocket, and it's all done with the JSON format, which is pretty commonly used now in web application development. And so this is an example here of what a sample request would look like. And so in this case, this is actually looking to set the temperature on the like, driver's side, I guess, to 16 degrees. And so HVAC set is actually a particular uh, uh, binding verb. And so the res res re uh, request response are actually in JSON. So you get you know, elaborate uh, requests back or uh, response back. And you could decode that. And you actually see you might get a more detailed er error message in the JSON format. It can be structured. Uh, as well, you can subscribe and unsubscribe to events. And the events also arrive uh, through the WebSocket as JSON, but asynchronously. Uh, and so once again, there's a lot more details available. And so based on this mechanism, there are now quite a few APIs available in AGL. So Matt's going to run through quickly, <laughs> given we're running out of time quickly, uh, what, what bindings are available today and a quick blurb on each one. So you can see this big list of what's upstream already. Um, if you can imagine, there's lots more to go. And we've talked a little bit about where things need to go, and you can imagine some. But we're going to go through these pretty quick. Um, first, I want to just point out that if you're really carefully paying attention, what you'll realize is all we're doing is a glorified wrapper at the end of the day around common libraries, right? So. It's always the details that matter, though, right? Um, so we've got, we're building a shared library that does JSON waste WebSocket uh, transactions, right, and talks to um, some sort of middleware, right, that, that we've exposed or, or have in the base image. So um, we have uh, all those ones I just showed that are upstream right now. Um, some of them are still work in progress, like everything in the world. Uh, and then if we look at the work in progress bindings, we have audio bindings still being worked on. They'll plan to come in, and some new home screen and window manager, new revision of those, and CAN bindings. All right, so let's talk about the master binding. Um, this is kind of the, the root of all the goodness, if you will. Um, so this, this binding manages uh, application lifecycle. So in any cohesive application framework, you have some basic operations you need to do, right? You have a third party set of applications you need to be able to install, uninstall, right? Start, terminate, pause, resume, all these kind of things. Very straightforward. Um, so if we look at the binding APIs, and uh, what you're going to see is this concept of these verbs. Um, so the verbs are our calls that we can make, and you're going to see this um, throughout all these examples, and you'll see some definite pl patterns on this. Um, so this is a wrapper, in this case, around the AGL-specific application framework. Um, so to accomplish all those things, right, you can make these calls through JSON and WebSocket to um, the application framework, and you can get the state on something. Um, you can install or uninstall packages and so forth. Um, there are no events. Um, Scott mentioned, right, things work asynchronously. The re responses are asynchronous. There aren't any events defined with these. These are all um, uh, call response uh, type uh, actions. So let's jump into something that's more of a connectivity type thing, fundamental. Um, so what we have today, and this is still going through some iterations as we mature and have more dependencies on the Bluetooth binding, but the Bluetooth does exactly what you would expect, right? Device discovery, pairing, right? Connection, settings, right? Um, we also have the need for things that are more at a use case level of you get in the vehicle and you have multiple phones paired and there's two of them present in the vehicle, it needs to know which one to connect to, right? So you need a device priority list exposed. So there's, um, uh, there's verbs there to manipulate that and pull from that. And I'll explain how that's used later um, by another binding. Um, AVRCP uh, controls are managed through the Bluetooth binding. That's their home now. Things can get reorganized. It's like any open source project. We're going to continue to evolve, right? We may split some things out into a separate binding. Um, media metadata uh, position tracking is also housed here. Um, 
future work, try to cover future work. We need to do some cleanup in this binding. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, so no real surprises here. Um, everything I said there, just you can you can uh, you know deal with the RF kill interface through through power uh, verb right start and stop discovery. You see connection stuff. Um, when I mention cleanup, there's a number of things where we have um, some old bindings don't have a. Um, uh, a model where it's a, a single verb that's a getter, setter type API, right? So you'll see some of those anomalies on Bluetooth and Wi-Fi bindings. That's why we mentioned some cleanups necessary. But when you clean up, you also have to fix the apps, right? Um, this is one where um, most of these uh, closer to production type bindings that are dealing with real I.O. have events, right? So we need to be able to process events while we're running an app that a device just showed up. Because uh, what if your Bluetooth was off on your phone, you got it in the car? Um, it needs an event, right, when that thing reappears so it can go and connect and so forth. So um, all the good bindings are event driven like this um, for connectivity type things. So the Wi-Fi binding. Again, no surprises. Um, and I should mention Bluetooth binding, obviously, its big dependency is BlueZ, right? Um, is what it's wrapping around in that Dbus API. Um, the Wi Fi binding discovers Wi Fi APIs, right? Connect to di disconnect, it can handle WPA2, pass key input, right? That's all done through, uh, through Dbus. Um, <clears throat> gather status, and then it, it also manages the network connection. So it's kind of like a Wi-Fi and network manager binding in once right now. So future work, it needs a little bit of cleanup. It probably needs to be split into a network um, bearer management type um, binding plus some provider, right, where Wi-Fi is one, maybe uh, WAN is another, for example. It's kind of a logical separation going forward. Um, that API looks a bit like this. Again, this is one where, you know, scan could be a getter setter um, single verb, right, after we clean this up a little bit. Um, but uh, um, one thing I didn't mention is that what you'll see on every binding that has events is you'll see a subscribe and unsubscribe. So that allows the client, which can be either an application, right, or another binding, so you have the ability to stack bindings, right? So you have these shared libraries, and you have one binding stack on another. So if we had a network bearer management type binding, it could depend on the Wi-Fi binding and the WAN binding, for example, right? Um, and um, so uh, you may, uh, a network bearer management binding might subscribe to those uh, events, right, um, for the network list and so forth. Um, to uh, manage Wi-Fi access points. Uh, the radio binding, um, this is uh, radio tuner binding, conventional, old school, over the air, believe it or not. Um, we got to have that, right? Um, and uh, right now, it's based on the, the RTL-SDR um, code. Um, and um, there's, there's a, a number of features specific to the, uh, the current demo apps. Um, that we talk about here, not, not super relevant, but the, the, the important thing is it sports an RTL SDR dongle, mostly because there's not a lot of good commodity AM, AM FM tuners that interface well um, that you, you can get at. Um, so we use that um, to uh, drive development on this. Uh, in the future, it'd be nice to do some additional tuner hardware support on some of the real automotive platforms. And um, uh, metadata, right, RDS support, HD tuner support are some obvious paths to go. So we just do uh, AM, FM right now. Um, it looks like uh, this. Uh, so again, you'll see um, the, the uh, subscribe and unsubscribe later in the verb list. We use that same model throughout all the APIs, right? Um, so let's say we start, we start a scan, right, with scan start. Um, that's an asynchronous event. Right? Depending on where you're at, that could take five seconds to scan through and maybe not even find anything. So um, that's uh, event driven. You're, you're going to get the event back uh, station found right? um, when it finds a, a station, and then you can update your UI and so forth. Uh, everything else pretty much straightforward. So I'll keep going through this. Uh, telephony binding. 
Um, this was one of the earlier bindings uh, that uh, is a, what, what we'll call a, a stackable or it's a, it's a client of another binding. Uh, so this does Bluetooth HFP support, does what you expect, originate, answer calls, right? Get some status on the call, right? Maybe the, the remote party hung up, right? And we can get uh, information like the CLIP and COLP number identification, right? Um, <clears throat> And this depends on Ophono, BlueZ, and Pulse Audio, right? Ophono is the, uh, the actual uh, voice call agent and for, for, for Pulse Audio, or BlueZ. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have some more features we're working on for this, uh, which is uh, being able to in-call, send dial tones, call waiting, for hold, forwarding, um, and then uh, voice modem support for those WAN modems that support voice calls. Um, so this is the current API. Uh, we dial, hang up, answer, and then everything's event driven, right? Um, we have to be able to know, right, get the event that an incoming call is there, right? Um, so that we can pop up a either I answer or I decline button, right? So um, when you're, you're doing a phone app, um, like we've had to modify, those are the types of things you handle in the app the way that Scott was showing with, with processing these uh, events in, uh, in an API. Um, there's a media scanner bind binding, and so that back ends on light media scanner. Um, again, more common middleware stuff from the Linux world, and um, so uh, that, uh, that binding simply scans removable data now, keeps a database, and we can access that, and we get events um, based on uh, new uh, data being available. Uh, so it's a very simple one. Um, you subscribe to the events. Uh, it'll let you know um, if there's new uh, media added, removed, so you can sort that in your playlists and, your, and, and do what you need to do in your you know, specific media player application. Uh, there's a new media player binding. This is in very early development, but because you know, uh, everything's done very incrementally in the open, we have an early version of this media player binding uh, upstream, and uh, it's simply playback and control, depends on GStreamer. Up, up until, well, now it's being worked on, be, being integrated into the demo media player app, all of our, um, all of our media playback in the, the actual demo Layer so the meta uh, AGL demo layer apps uh, was done with the the Qt uh, QML media player, right? So it's a Qt media player object um, doing all that playback. So we're decoupling those things. Part of this theme of getting the UI abstracted from from the actual back end of things. Uh, in the future, we'll add video playback into this binding. Uh, it's very simple. Um, you can uh, uh, set up a playlist uh, for it. Um, you can get the current state of the playlist and modify that. Uh, you can get metadata, and then you subscribe on subscribe to events. Um, so as the playlist changes, you get event, um, and um, you get events based, uh, metadata events that tell you the position, duration of a track as that continues, because you need that to update the UI, right? The, uh, position in, in a visual sense. Okay, and then the next set, we have uh, a whole bunch of uh, location-based services. Um, simple wrappers again, uh, uh, GPS binding, right, just wraps around GPSD, so it's exact same set of GNSS data that you will get from GPSD protocol, so latitude, longitude, altitude, speed and time, right, and uh, and very, these ones become very simple. Um, so you have a simple getter, you can subscribe to event, and then you get that same data on the event location thing. So you have the ability to just go pull that in a polled way, but most, most usage models mean, uh, dictate that you'll be subscribing and just allowing it to give you the regular update on the location data. A follow-on to this one was the GeoClue binding. So you might detect a little overlap here if you know what GeoClue does. Um, so GeoClue has location data as well, almost the same set. It also adds heading data. Um, but what's important about GeoClue is it expands the realm of providers of location data to what modern systems require. So we don't always have a fix 
on enough satellites. We're in a building. You can use GeoClue can gather location data from Wi-Fi uh, AP databases, right? The 3GPP, if I get that right, tower information, um, the GIP databases, right? And GPS as well. Uh, so there's a little overlap with the standalone GPS binding there. Um, it's got the almost exact same API. Well, it is the exact same except the actual parameters. You also get a heading out of that based on how well GeoClue can do that. Um, this was added in uh, to better support location um, services the way that most modern uh, mobile operating systems do so. And so on top of that, there's another stack binding, a geofence binding. It's kind of a critical part of modern um, mobile APIs and location services is the ability to add a bounding box and track uh, egress, ingress events in, with that box, right? Um, there's also the concept of a dwelling time uh, or, or, or a dwell status, I should say. And so dwelling is the concept of based on a timeout, right, of, um, of entering, right, a bounding box then you create a special event. That means, OK, this, for example, the use case that drives this, and you may see that in your favorite mobile operating system, is something notices that you've arrived at home and triggers some behavior, right? And that's typically based on some timeout, right? So a dwell indicator might set it at 10 minutes, right? And then you get an event. Um, so that you can policy drive that with this API. Um, <clears throat> through these uh, interfaces. So the way it works is you take uh, a min, max, latitude, longitude. You can add a fence with those parameters. So you've got a, a bounding box. You can remove it. You can list where they're at. Um, you can set the dwell transition time um, before that event happens. And of course, subscribe and unsubscribe these events. So um, a geofence uh, fence event will tell you, hey, I've entered. I've exited one of these fence fences, or hey, we just hit dwell, right? And it'll tell you which fence and so forth. And one of the things, probably future, right now the dwell transition time is fixed across all the fences. Oops. And uh, we will probably um, add uh, per fence dwell transition timing as one of the big things. Okay. Um, what Scott talk about next steps? Quickly. <laughs> Uh, so, in addition to some of the uh, cleanups and uh, feature changes that uh, Matt's just described with the bindings, the roadmap includes uh, additions such as uh, Bluetooth, Bluetooth PBAP support, which basically would be addition of uh, contacts database from your phone through the Bluetooth binding, so the telephony app can actually bring up your uh, name of a caller and uh, do sort of you know the typical caller ID that you get on a mobile device today, actually have that as part of the AGL API. Uh, complete the media player binding, actually you know, start integrating with the, the uh, demo apps and add video support. Um, basically uh, get that working hopefully for you know, early next year. Uh, it's a very big ask that comes up very commonly about uh, AGL as being able to actually have video playback as part of the uh, API. Uh, adding a speech recognition and uh, t uh, text to speech bindings. There's actually been uh, recently at the AMM last week, there's uh, some new member companies that provide uh, basically libraries for this, as well as there's a couple of big open source projects actually building an API interface for that, having a binding that you could actually use in a demo app or as part of the, your product to actually do the very common things that you see in a, a car today, incoming text being translated into speech, vice versa. Um, so that's a feature that's really required in AGL going forward. Uh, Matt's mentioned the WAN support, so actually uh, doing a WAN binding and actually doing the work to actually integrate voice calls if the, if the modem actually has voice support. And as well, we mentioned the audio bindings. This would be a, a work to actually build a first-class interface for audio in uh, AGL. That's basically application developers can work against and actually pull out the audio manager as it stands today, very likely, or refactor it into something that works a bit better with the AGL application framework. And so that's hopefully coming quite soon, and the applications can start to convert over and use that API. And there's a new win home screen and window manager binding that's actually going to allow much more sophisticated home screen behavior than some of the uh, existing demo apps. 
There's uh, been some external demos that have a quite fancy multi-screen. That's going to become a first-class citizen in the uh, AGL API, hopefully, very soon. And we'll see much more sophisticated demos, hopefully, that are upstream. And so if you want to get involved, do you want to take over? <laughs> so the community it has uh, uh, you know, a lot of support channels. We have IRC channel on Freenode, the mailing list. Uh, there's a weekly developer call that you, anybody can call in if they want to take part and uh, pose a question or uh, ask about an issue they have. There's an open uh, Jira and Garrett. If you have a Linux Foundation ID, which anyone can create, you can file a Jira issue against AGL if you have a feature request or a bug. And if you actually want to upload a change, you can do that through Garrett. And there's, of course, we've mentioned the docs site. There's also a nice wiki site that has you know, some startup guides, uh, information about the releases. And feel free to check those out and you know, find out a lot more about AGL. And there's a couple of nice links there to some of the getting started stuff. And come, come join us, right? Like every open source project that desperately needs more developers. We're, we're lonely, right? Come join us at IRC and <laughs> stuff. Exactly. So um, we're over time, of course. Um, real quick, Consulco Group is hiring. We're looking for engineers. Come talk us, talk to us. It's a gratuitous ad here. Um, and but more importantly, come to the technology showcase tomorrow evening. We're demoing two AGL platforms with some of these bindings and apps. So you can actually see the thing for real instead of us talking about it. Thanks. I Thank think you. We can take questions outside. <laughs> yeah, if you have questions, we'll be outside. Yeah.